everyone and welcome to the Council of Elrond where we discuss all things Lord of the Rings. I am your host Dave and I'm joined by your other host Johnny but today we also have a very special guest as he likes to be referred to and he's going to help us break down the fourth episode of the Rings of Power. I'm sure all you guys know who this is, Harry from Fellowship of Fans but just in case you don't, Harry would you like to introduce yourself and let our listeners know where to find you exactly? Hello, um, I think you've already given me a very nice introduction, but if um, if you don't know me, I'm Harry from Fellowship of Fans. It's a channel on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, where I discuss um, just leaks, rumours, general discussions about the Rings of Power show. And yeah, if you want to um, check us out, go to all those platforms to see us on. So yeah, but I'm very excited to discuss episode four today. Yeah, yeah, and we're we're, gonna, we're very excited to have you on and to discuss it with you. Thank exactly, you. And, and we'll put all Harry's links down in the podcast description below. But yes, we will be discussing the fourth episode of The Rings of Power. But before we begin, I'd love to encourage all you guys to check us out on YouTube too, because that's our new growing channel. And if you'd like to... Um, help us keep putting out these weekly podcasts you can check out our patreon where you can become a member and we're actually reviewing all the episodes of house of the dragon over there each week so links to all those are in our social sorry the links to all of our socials and patreon and everything they're in the podcast info section as well go check us out also you guys i'm really sorry if i sound terrible but i'm recovering from the flu i think i'm recovering from something so um yeah, <laughs> but you yeah, ate let's, uh, stew the other day, didn't you? I did. Yeah, it was rank. You have not seen what I have seen. So, um, let us begin, Harry. Uh, let's let's talk about episode four, which was called "The Great Wave." What did you make of the huge opening for this episode with Muriel and mm. Numenor? The funny thing was, is that from about a few like months or months before, when we got a leak about, you know, it was just, oh, um, Miriel is going to be like kissing some babies on their foreheads, then there's going to be a massive wave. And you're like, oh, okay. But then I've seen it just for the first time in action with all the context needed. It was a dream. Um, it was pretty intense, is what I have to say. It, it was grand, it was intense. I was surprised how far they went with it, actually showing the wave destroy Numenor and mm. how much they are foreshadowing beforehand. I thought maybe some of that would be a surprise. But yeah, it just came at you straight away. And it, the thing I liked about it at the same time, it set the tone for the episode. It like it allowed us to, for the first few episodes, I know you could say it's a bit slow, it took its time to get on, but here, boom, straight in, few buildings getting destroyed you know, Miriam nearly dying, and then, you know, getting to the episode. So I think it was a yeah, really, really strong start. Mm. Yeah. yeah, John, did you love it? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, what's funny is that what uh, Harry just touched on there, the fact that uh, some previous episodes, people have maybe been complaining about them being slow, building up, or whatever, which I haven't personally found that, but regardless, the beginning of this episode probably took me a half an hour to watch because I just I was just pausing it nonstop, just staring at the little details of what was going on, like just getting freeze frames of all the details. Like before we even saw Muriel, the opening shot of uh, Numenor, when we saw just from the that big, like, I don't know, helicopter shot sort of thing, uh, sweeping around and we saw the the huge uh, building where Muriel was in there holding court or whatever she was doing. Um that was just so beautiful. I was just, I paused it for ages. I was looking at like the roads and where they, like how they led into the little houses and the detail is just absolutely insane. I just, it took me so long. And then obviously when that wave came in, it was even, uh, I don't know, it took me, it, there was a lot more pausing happening where I was like watching just things <laughs> like in slow motion getting crushed. And I thought it was absolutely incredible. Just the visual aspect, the giant wave in the background behind uh, all of the destruction, just, you know, it, it was just i don't know this impending doom coming towards the, the the city and uh yeah as harry just said as well a really strong start to an episode to really throw you in it to set the mood so um i thought it was a very good start yeah and i don't know about you guys but i did not think that this was a dream i 
Oh, I kind of I suspect it all it happens. Movie. To, yeah, well, maybe you could if you were pausing it every like second. Yeah, I was true, watching yeah. it, and it happened in like such a short space of time that I was like, "Oh my god, this this can't be happening! Is this happening?" And yeah, everything just kind of went out the window, and I was getting freaked out. But uh, yeah. yeah, what a what a way to start! You ca- you you got swept you got swept up in it. Yeah, in the wave. Do you think yeah. it's a hey. an actual? <laughs> Do you think it's a premonition or do you think it was just her looking into the, the Palantir? Because she kind of woke from a dream, it looked like. But uh, I assume that this is something that she foresaw in this future telling Palantir. I I think it's maybe like a mix of both, maybe. So it's maybe come from the Palantir. But since then, she's having these reoccurring dreams. That's one way yeah. to look at it. So it originated from the Palante, but um I it it would be it would have been a bit not strange but it would be interesting if she were just having these dreams of like Newman the downfall of Newman out of nowhere. So I do think maybe linking it to I think she did, she even said on the first day she was became she, well her reign began which I don't want to say she was crowned queen because she's a queen regent but the first day of her rule while everybody else was was like enjoying themselves it took her to the Palan. She, well, she was. She went to the Palantir, and then that's when she had the first yeah. vision and dream of that. So mm-hmm. I do think they're right. interlinked somehow. Also, yeah. when when she told Galadriel to place her hand upon upon the Palantir, and obviously there was no time for Galadriel to explain to her. Oh, guess what I just saw. Galadriel just kind of just stepped back, and Muriel immediately knew what she had seen. So it seems like maybe this Palantir just shows one thing over and over yeah. again. It's not like. So that's kind of weird. I don't know what I think it is. A that, weird palantir. So um, just stuck on repeat. <laughs> stuck on repeat on one event in the future. This is like a solely Numenor palantir or destruction of Numenor palantir. But mm. I will get into that later. But um, the next scene we move on to is the guildsmen are all chatting about elves. I thought this was quite cool. They were talking about how they don't tire and they're coming to like take our jobs and they don't <laughs> age and they're going to take our jobs and our women and all this kind of stuff. And it's yeah. just kind of funny, but I, I enjoyed that uh, hearing a bit of chat. And then obviously Farazan comes and riles up the men about Numenor and how it's an Island of men. And you know, that was the scene that we saw from the trailers. And I think a lot of people thought that this was going to be Farazan announcing his, you know, his, his uh, plans to be, to reign yeah. on Numenor and, I think a lot of people were like, Ugh, it doesn't look great, but I was so satisfied when I saw it. this is just him out in the streets yeah, hearing some people squabble about the elves and he's just kind of trying to calm the nerves. And uh, yeah, I thought this was a cool scene. What do you think mm. about it, John? Yeah, no, I, I agree with that point uh, that when we saw these images before, it seemed like this was some sort of like an organized speech that he was giving to the public. And for that reason, it seemed weird that there was so few people and they were kind of, you know, they weren't all kind of squashing up to try and hear him. They were kind of all spaced out. So it seemed a lot more natural in the show that he kind of just, these people were out and about and they were kind of listening to the other guy who, the guy has, who has the worst haircut in the world and the fat head, uh, that guy. Who? Um, Low man. uh, The guy, the guy who just kept calling Halbrad uh, low man. Oh, that guy, yeah. You know, he he stood up and started giving a speech and he was the guy that started saying they're taking our jobs and they can't, you know, they're, (laughs) And he was also saying that to Halbrand the day before when he was like, oh, you've come mm. here, you're enjoying our ale and what will you have next? And he's like, how about your women? <laughs> and so <laughs> this guy, this is apparently just his speech that he's always given that like people are coming in and taking their, like Halbrand was taking them and now the elves are taking them. So he's obviously, that guy's character. Is he's just, just very with. insecure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So he wants uh, Numenor's jobs and food and, and women. So anyway, uh, he... Um, so then, yeah, I, I liked the way that Farazan came in and he almost like saw this as an opportunity to, yeah, like you said, maybe calm the men down, but also for the men, the general public to see him as this, you know, true leader. He's on their side. And Farazan, I think, I like him. He think I think he looks cool. He's He knows how to play the game and mm. I nearly said the Game of Thrones. He knows how to, you know, uh, get in there and um, get the people on his side, regardless whether he actually believes that or not. I suppose. Yeah, he knows how to play the Rings of Power. I suppose. Um, this <laughs> is around the same the s- ring to it. No. Oh. Hey. <laughs> My um, we are. It's around the scene as well that we get to meet uh, Farazan's son. So this is the only new character I think that we get in this episode. And uh, what do you think about this fella, Harry? 
Kemen, I believe his name was. I thought they said Kevin, but I had the subtitles on. <laughs> I thought it was a very funny name. Like, I think, I think Johnny said um, that Loman who had is rivaled for the worst haircut, but I think Kemen is up there for one oh, of the worst yeah. haircuts as well. Yeah, and I think pretty much. we're already seeing his... He, from the original <laughs> conversation with Patterson that we saw at the start, he seemed quite naive and like he's just learning and he's on the road. But then... When we go to scenes when he's with the audience, and he's like he's he's basically hitting on her for like the whole oh, episode. Yeah. There's mm. a lot of flirting happening there, and I think it's interesting because the the son of Farazon and the daughter of Elendil, you know, faithful versus Kingsman down the line. How's that going to work out? How's that dynamic going to play? We already know Yardian doesn't really like the elves, so does that? It'd be funny if it's like I I don't want to reference the Last Jedi. But it's like, you know, you've got Kylo Ren and you've got Go for it. Um, Rey and then you, they're like opposites in some way and, you know, Kylo Ren maybe end becomes good. It's like some of that maybe, you know, maybe Kemen doesn't like his fire fo- mm. and stuff in the end. Because there was even a line where he says when he first meets her, when he's, when Ayardian praised Farazon's ability to turn over a crowd, he was like, oh, I find it quiet. I forgot it's like distasteful or like, he, he was like mocking. Yeah. His thing, mm. so it seems like there is something, maybe a bit of envy towards his father. So I think it's an interesting character, to say the least. And I think a lot of the theories going around about him is maybe becoming a, a, a Nazgul at some point. So I think, oh. wait, so I think that's yeah, the theory just, about any any random <laughs> any new character show. over the show. Maybe Sadler yeah. Burrows, Ringwraith. Burrows. Oh wow, that would be so. Amazing. You are suggesting that Aarian and Kemen are a dyad in the Force, just like Kylo and Rey. Mm-hmm. But yeah. uh, so, I, I thought just... this exactly last week when we got introduced to Aarian. I was like, I bet you she's going to be just kind of shoehorned in for some sort of love plot. But now the fact that you know she's getting close with Farazan's son, this just makes things so much more interesting. So mm. I'm all for it. Yeah, sorry, Johnny. I think what no. I, um, what I was going to say before was that um, the the Tolkien professor. I heard him uh, a while ago talking about this show. I think it was maybe just after the release of the first episodes. And he said that he's now playing a game which is called Dead or Nazgul. And it's yeah. just basically any characters that he sees that are kind of newer characters. He's just saying, okay, what's what's their their uh, you know their end going to be? Are they going to die or are they going to be a Nazgul? And so that's the way he's kind of looking at the show. I but, hope they um, die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he was kind of saying, like people like Bronn, when he was like, I really hope she dies because that's the, you know, the lesser of the two evils. But... um. <laughs> I was also going to say Aarian. I like her character so far, and I agree with you as well. I thought that initially she was going to be kind of shoehorned in for maybe a love story or something like that. But um, eventually, I think, well, my thoughts now is that maybe she could end up falling in love with uh, Farazan's son and then maybe breaking away from her own family's kind of faithfulness. And maybe that's the reason why they've introduced her as a new character so that they can keep the you know Isildur and and Arion uh, as being faithful mm. but they're going to have like one child of Elendil that maybe doesn't become faithful and ends up maybe ultimately you know suffering the fate of Numenor so, or maybe she could be a Nazgul maybe she could be a Nazgul but <laughs> anyway could e- be a Nazgul. <laughs> either way I think that, that that could be a really kind of you know heartfelt thing where yeah. Elendil maybe loses a daughter or something so that could be something mm. to like you know de- develop his character even more for the series some have been saying that maybe because she's an architect, maybe she does helps designs the temple. I will see at some point. That'd yeah. be an interesting oh, yeah. way wow, yeah. to yeah. incorporate that. God, that would be awful. But uh, <laughs> yeah. let's uh, let's uh, keep moving on. So the the next scene we get is Galadriel requesting uh, Muriel's aid for the Southlands in that kind of courtroom scene, mm-hmm. and um, basically Muriel says Numenor has chosen another path. And then you see a Lendil in the background when Galadriel says, "Not all Numenor," which I found to be quite a quite an interesting scene. What did you yeah. make of this, Harry? It's interesting because they are really playing with the Lendil's lineage and his past. Because in the first few, we don't. He makes it sound like he's just uh, like an just he's now no longer a, from a line of important people. He's just a sailor. And then we get a hint like that. It's like there is they are toying with it, which I find quite interesting. So it's something that I hope they will develop on. 
and carry on, you know, hinting at that. But yeah, that was a nice little hint that they gave. Yeah. John, mm. did you like this? I, I liked how Galadriel, I think in the first, was it the first episode or maybe, no, the, sorry, the most recent episode, episode three, where she just kind of gets really angry at Muriel in the in the court for no reason, whereas at least this time they had a bit more of a dialogue and then she... Before she, she got angry. Goes, she, yeah, and then she's like, my tempest is something. No, I can't no, remember. Yeah, Muriel says something like, oh, there, there, a tempest follows you or something. And she said, there is a tempest in me. And that was yeah, the line, exactly. that was the line from the... From the trailer, uh, there is a tempest in me. But again, it was kind of one of those things that it just seemed weird in the trailer. And here, out of context, at least it was yeah, it was out of context. And here, it seems like okay, it makes sense because Muriel had just used the word tempest beforehand. So yeah, yeah. again, I'm pretty pretty much nearly every scene that I'm seeing play out in the show compared to in the trailers, I'm usually happier with its uh, with the final result rather than I was. Oh, definitely. Trailer. So again. I'm glad I'm not the kind of person that would just watch a trailer and completely make up make my mind up on on a series, and uh, so that's one good thing. But regarding the actual scene, um, I have to give a big shout out to to Elendil for his his uh, comedy in the scene as well, where um, Miriam says, "Oh, and I guess Elendil is an emperor." Blah. I can't remember what she yeah. said, and he's just like, "No, just a lowly lord or something," and he gives this like little smile, and then yeah. she just like looks at him, and he's like, "Oh, never mind," kind of thing. Uh, I just um, I. I had a proper giggle at that, so um, I don't know. I, I feel like that. I'm just loving Elendil more and more with with each yeah. passing scene. Like he just yeah, seems so class. good, and even though he was barely really part of this episode, but he still mm. kind of stole the, the the limelight for me. Um, yeah. Oh, also, since we were discussing bad haircuts, I want to hear everyone <laughs> else's thoughts on who has the worst haircut in the show because I am going to throw Theo's name into the into the hat as well because it's a pretty pretty poor. I have a theory haircut. for that. Why he has oh. a bad haircut? Yes. A well, fellowship of fans, there you go. Yep. A bow haircut, which coincidentally covers his ears. So, you know, oh. we haven't seen a shot of his ears yet. And if that is maybe Bonwin, you know, making sure he doesn't get his hair cut below his shoulders. Wow. Then, you know, oh. maybe maybe she's been so, seeing more than a ronde. Or maybe. Or maybe she's been seeing a ronde for longer than yeah. we know. Mm-hmm. I thought hmm. you were suggesting maybe he doesn't have any ears. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all know what that means, according to the law. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it means you're Sauron. <laughs> um, um, but I, I would just wait say one thing about that scene where they're in the yeah. courtroom again. I, I was a little bit let down by Galadriel's speech and her plea to Muriel. I just thought that she was going to bring like a stronger argument. When I was watching it, I was just like, I don't blame Muriel for just being like, nah. I just didn't yeah. think she was giving her loads of reasons to actually kind of say, okay, I really need to get on board here. So um, it's just, it was a small thing. I think she maybe did a little bit better. She kind of redeemed it later on. But or maybe the reason was so that we, she goes down and meets Halbrand and he kind of explains, we look, the courtroom and politics is not your forte. So mm. maybe that was the reason. But I remember just thinking, she's an ancient elf. Like she should just have a way with words that can kind of blow um, the normal human men or even the Numenorean men just blow them out of the water by just like their their wisdom and I don't know I just felt it was a little bit lacking but that's maybe I did I feel have, that too did you yeah okay. I, no I, I understand what you mean and another thing that kind of makes me ponder with this show is like every time Galadriel in this episode as well she brings up Sauron to Muriel and it was just kind of in passing it was just like yeah, well, Sauron's forces are gathering and like he's going to take over this place and she didn't like pay any heed to it at all. Like there was no scene of Gladriel going, by the way, Sauron is back. And Muriel being like, oh my goodness. Um, yeah, yeah. It's just kind of passed off. So I don't know, is that an off-screen conversation or maybe does Muriel just like not believe Galadriel but anyways um, all this she needs to work on her presentation skills Galadriel she does be like look build up to a crescendo and be like ta-da Sauron's back yeah so here's my powerpoint presentation yeah exactly three point plan on why this is bad (laughs) so all this uh, tempestry or whatever the word would be gets uh, Galadriel locked away for sedition as she calls it where she gets Mm -hmm. to be rejoined with her lovely Sauron friend, I mean, um, Halbrand, <laughs> and they get to have a little conversation before what happens. Farazon comes down and he basically says that we're kicking Galadriel out and then Galadriel has a kind of a weird maneuver to get all the guards in the prison. What did you think about this scene, John? Like how the whole thing played out? Um, 
the scene when they're now down in the cells and all that kind of stuff. In the cells, um, yeah. Yeah, with Halron. I mean, Halbrand. Um, <laughs> Salbrand. That's, that's, that's my name for him. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I, I, I liked... I think maybe in the first couple of se- couple of episodes that we saw Halbrand, I just didn't like his character really at all. I think in episode three, I started warming up to him. I was like, I'm, I much preferred him in episode three. And then in ep- this episode, I liked his performance as well. I think like the actor's performance, I think was really good. Um, I like that. Um, I mean, he does seem very wise. He does, he does seem charming and he does seem these other things that makes me worry about who he truly is. It's but I just, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I like, I, I liked what I saw of Halbrand here. I, I liked his advice to Galadriel and yeah, I enjoyed that scene in general. Yeah, um, I thought it was interesting in the scene when Farazan comes down and all the guards are being shoved in and Farazan draws a sword and Halbrand's the one to kind of advise him on what not to do. And I was like, ooh, is this the first time we're mm, going to see mm. Halbrand offering his whispering advice? Whispering in the to, ear. Yeah, whispering in the ears of Farazan. And yeah, he did seem very wise and like all together i suppose yeah what about you also, harry Galad- did you pick up anything on this i was gonna say galadriel was just very it she found it very easy to just you know disarm the three guards and just push yeah, them into yeah. the cell. and even when she pushed pushed them in she just kind of closed the door very gently as if none of them were trying to get out and all of them i'm, I'm assuming are carrying a sword so they, they didn't even try to stick Poker. a sword out <laughs> through the yeah they were just like oh, i guess we're in here now kind of thing so mm-hmm. um, I, I thought that was kind of maybe cartoonishly done a little bit but yeah. a little bit yeah i what you... for me in that scene the most interesting thing i actually have the lines here it is li- listen to what halban says his advice quote you do well to identify what your opponent most fears then of course galadu replies and says and exploit it then he says no Give them a means of mastering it so you can master them. Yeah. That's really on the nose, in my opinion. My yeah. goodness. Yeah, like, that was really cool. Like, you, that's basically, you know, if you want to rephrase it in some ways, it's basically um, you identify where your opponent most fears, then apply this to Celebrimbo, and then you teach him the means of mastering it through ring making, and then through the one ring. And through the dominion and the taint and Antal has over all the other rings, you can master them, and that's what results in the with the down uh, the forging of the rings and the ring race, etc. So I think it was quite an interesting um, little little Easter egg, and it could be putting us off the track and making us think, you know, Salbrand might be a thing, but <laughs> we'll have to we'll have to see. It seems like they're throwing out so many of these. Easter eggs and now it's getting to a point where it seems overly obvious and I just kind of hope that these are red herrings and they're like well anyone could be Sauron you're we're making you think this guy's Sauron because he likes you know he likes metalwork and crafting and he's whispering in the ears of people and yeah I I hope it's just red herrings but sure look we'll we'll see what the what the show um produces there after this we get our first glimpse of Isildur in this episode, of course, and he's out with the cadets, and we hear that whisper again going, Isildur. And then, of course, he purposely gets kicked out of cadet school for acting the Aegis and um, he has a little f- fight with two of his mates. So, did you enjoy this, or what do you think of uh, Isildur's decision making in this scene? Ooh. He is quite, let's say, he's, I think Elendil says it best in the um, sec- third episode. I have a daughter who runs fast, and then I think is a son who runs blind. I think the yeah, blind. That was the line. Yeah, yeah. If you see that there, it's like it's just an instinctive decision he makes, and it'd be funny if throughout the show they're gonna have the sealed or like create a history of him just making these deci- like flick of the switch decisions that yeah. might be good, maybe bad. And if you do, you add up history. Then once it comes, to, you know, season five, like episode seven when you know they're on the top of uh, Mount Doom and there's you know you got the Isildur and then yeah. it it might mirror that and maybe that's what the show runners are going for and another thing around all that Isildur stuff except from you know whacking his mate um who who actually I think I I'm fair enough for that with him punching his mate if he went if his mother's death meant a lot to him 
then you know maybe go and actually to be fair he did get kicked out of cadet school because he still would do you know they're both they're both in the wrong okay that's how it goes there but it's interesting that everybody calls him a seal and I feel like it's the interesting thing is the name Isildo I feel like is going to be an important part of the show for some reason because first of all all the that women on the coast saying it first of all and we never really hear his name being said for and I really feel like as that's like a purposeful thing so that's like the whole character of him something I've just noticed maybe yeah but in some ways has his do... father not said it yeah he said it what? once but everybody ran and goes Isil 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 so just an interesting thing, but it could, it could just be absolutely nothing. But I just think the fact it's mixed in with that woman going is on the side. It's like maybe they are brewing something. Maybe I kind of have the idea that it just makes it, it tells the audience that this is a younger person and he's mm. hanging out with his younger friends and they just have nicknames for each other. Yeah, and, that's fair. Um, yeah. But also, but I I do think that in terms of a name that's been shortened, that could actually end up being more important later on maybe Theo as well. I'm not sure. Theodred? Like, yes. what could it... Like, I think, I don't know, there could be something else behind that as well. So, maybe Theoron. it'll be of some importance. Theo, <laughs> yeah. Theo. <laughs> Theory of it being Sauron? Oh, yeah. Theory. <laughs> maybe he's Gandalf. Theo, Theo Dalf. Actually, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. <laughs> it sounds a bit like um, Lendulf. Alendilf. Oh, oh, I was brilliant. thinking if people are gonna, if we do see ever see Gandalf in the show, how many G- Gandalfs are we gonna? If some people are gonna catch on <laughs> at some point, I know it. If we, if we get it, so dreading oh, that. Oh no! Oh no! Well, speaking of Dilfs, uh, the next scene we get is Adar. We finally get to see him in the <laughs> flesh. So uh, yeah, serious Dilf, and he speaks of. I, I, well, the, the way he's introduced is quite interesting. He comes in and I thought, oh, maybe this is why they all worship him because he's like an orc healer and he just like kills an orc. So that mm. was that was nice. But um, yeah, John, what did you make of this scene? Getting to see Adder and getting him, getting to yeah, hear yeah. what he has to say? It was, I think it was a very strong introduction to this character. Uh, again, so much like... There's so much tension in all these kind of scenes in the Southlands, uh, all the mm. orc scenes from last week's episode. I just found myself so tense watching everything, which was really great. But um, that, like, when he, when you, he put his hand on the guy's head and you didn't know exactly what he was going to do, is he going to heal him? And then, obviously, he stabbed him and, you know, maybe put him out of his misery or whatever was going on. And it looked like almost he had a tear welling up in his eye as that happened. Yeah. So, obviously, he cares a lot about these orcs. And so that's cool. Obviously, there's, you know, we're probably go- hopefully going to find out more about his background uh, at some point. So I'm looking forward to that as well. But I like the way he spoke to um, Arondir as well. Mm, and yeah. we, we heard his voice. I think we all knew that from the trailers. Uh, like, you've been told many lies of Middle Earth. Well, actually, I think, I don't know if we They don't say Middle Earth in... Well, no. Well, I didn't know that. Maybe Harry probably knew that. Did you know yeah. this, Harry, that this was uh, Adar's the voice lines? of Adar? I think people on Reddit matched that voice to Joseph Marley. So, yeah, putting one and two together. So, yeah, <laughs> of like course that. they did. Mm, yeah, that wasn't <laughs> okay. me. I promise that... I'm not uh, really that much into it. But right, that was okay. one thing. Again, I like when they add things into the trailer or take things away that aren't really there because he doesn't say you have been of told Middle many Earth. lies of yeah. Middle Earth. He just said you've been told many lies and so- something, something. So he's uh, going to say of Middle Earth yeah. at some point. Mm. <laughs> maybe, or maybe they just add that in, you know, got him to record yeah, some extra no. lines. Um, but he also says, which is very interesting in this scene, he says, I am no God. Well, not yet. So what mm. do you think about that, Harry? I think it's very interesting for the part if if is he like talking in the sense that he is a god to these orcs or in his own mind that he will become a god when he you know creates his new world or whatever he's trying to build up so I think there's so many layers as to what he might mean by not being a god just yet and mm. I think I I I, I still think even someone as corrupted and messed up as he is, I don't, I don't think he believes he'll become a physical Valar. I think that's pretty much out of the equation. So he won't be one of the like the typical gods. But I think maybe I think with the with the name Adar, it's up, his name is not Adar. It's like something else. And I think we get a little like hint to that when he talks about talk going down a river in Beleriand, the same one as. Um, as a Ronde. So I think I think it either can be he's this god of this new world 
that he's trying to create. We see that with the Southlanders when he wants him to either submit to him or they'll die and have him as the new ruler. And I think that is mainly where they're trying to go with that. But, you know, it's, it's, really, it's really flexible, that line. So it can mean of so many things. Yeah, mm. but it, it did seem... Well, in my opinion, it seems like he was talking about being a physical god because he does mention how, you know, to create a new world that would that that can only be done by the gods. And I am no god. Well, not yet. And I think I don't know who he could be. Uh, I, I remember hearing someone say maybe he's the mouth of Sauron, but like that would have <laughs> that's a man, I believe. Who, yeah, uh, that's a like Numenorian, so, yeah. yeah, so that would have to be like years and years later. But if this is. Again, this could be like the Witch King or another what, Nazgul, the Witch and maybe King, he, could he be a Nazgul? Because they're they I don't think so. They're they're, they're men, rulers they? of men, so and he's an and elf. because he's got the pointy ears. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And yeah, maybe, but he he's all messed up. Like I, I th- he could be someone that Morgoth like kind of manipulated, and he's kind of a man, and I'm making him an orc, and he was a failed experiment, and. I don't know, but like the fact that he thinks he could become a god makes me feel like he's already been talking to Sauron and he's been promised this and S- Sauron has manipulated him into doing his deed, gathering all these orcs and he's promised to make him like a god and that's why he's kind of... Um, now, rem- well, another another thing could be that maybe Sauron has already got his sort of creation of rings plan going on and he's mm-hmm. thinking, I'm going to... Maybe he's promised a ring to this guy and yeah. said, like, I'll, I'll give you a ring and it'll make you, like, you know, godlike. Uh, yeah, It'll maybe. give you extra powers. And Sauron is not the most trustworthy guy. We should remember that as well. So maybe he's just whispered in this guy's ear as well and said, I will make you a god. Yep. And then just like, so, just so that this guy will carry out his bidding and then this guy is believing him at face value. So we don't really know. But I, I agree with Harry that I don't think this guy believes that he is eventually going to convert into like a Maya or a Vala or anything like that. So, but, but there's to, strong, uh, strong scene. St- mm-hmm. And to add to Dave's theory, this might be completely stupid, but you know, saying that maybe um, he thinks Sauron will make him a god. What happens if Sauron is the sword, the spirit in the sword, and he wants that sword because he knows that's going to help him make him become a god? That could be one way. Because oh that 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 sword does have power in it somehow, you know, harnessing yeah. him. You never know. He said, "Don't don't underestimate the sword." Oh no! Yeah. It's like a it's like a backwards uh, uh, Morgul blade or something. Mm-hmm. So moving on, after this, we get our first glimpse in this episode of the Southlands, and I didn't really have anything in my notes other than the fact that I thought it was really cool that. Bronwyn says something like, "Oh, this this is the last place from here to Orodruin." And I was like, "Oh, cool! Yeah. We get a name drop of the mountain of fire." So, um, that was something interest interesting to me though, because Orodruin isn't that is that Quenya for mountain of fire, and this mountain hasn't erupted yet, or you know, hasn't erupted in has it ever erupted at this point, or it wh- could it have Orodruin? during when when Morgoth when that lands was used during the period of the first age that it could have there but it's been well for for the second age at least it's been dormant that's the main thing it's been dormant yeah. during the second mm. age so it's just and it, it might have yeah. just had this nickname the whole time yeah, yeah if you look around yeah, you look at the that. lands how green the area is yeah. it, it can't it must have been centuries since Cent- it has yeah, actually thousands. at least had it maybe it's like you know maybe sometimes it smokes so people know but maybe. in terms of a large social smoker explosion. of course yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just just the odd time when it has a few drinks. Yeah. It has, it has and that's cool if, if the lands all around it are very green and fertile because that is true in real life that uh, volcanic um, soil is supposed to be extremely fertile and that's, that's why cool. you have lots of... That. Yeah, you've got lots of... Like if you look at Vesuvius and Pompeii, like that's why they were built so close to the mountain. Well, I don't know is that why, but like the land was so good there and there? so fertile. <laughs> I was there, I think. When it when it when it yeah. when it erupted. <laughs> no, I just I just missed that. No, I missed oh, out on that. That was a few thousand years before. But uh anyways, we get um, um, I was gonna just say that when oh, yeah. they are all entering into where that watchtower is, I got real like Helm's Deep arrival oh, yeah. vi- yeah. vibes as well. All the yeah, kind yeah. of village people coming in to, to take shelter where this tower was and where this sort of um I don't know, this 
safe area was or this this sort of uh, fort safe where they haven. could come and t- yeah the safe haven and they were like we're safe now kind of thing coming in and then like looking for you know um how much food do we have we need to ration this I don't know it just really felt like hands deep uh, when the vi- when um all the people finally arrived there so yeah never mind there's loads of things as well that are just I'm saying oh, oh yeah that reminds me of this and that reminds me of that and there's also lots of lines as well that I'm, I'll bring one up in a minute uh, that are like the exact same sentence that's been used in some Peter Jackson's movies in totally different contexts. But, um, and maybe it's normal that that, like, that's just the way that they spoke. So it's natural that some sentences will be repeated. But every time it happens, I'm like, that's, that's from that. There was one with Dune, I think. I'm not sure. It's it's Um, one he says of this Middle Earth. It's like, you remember it from, you know, when Saruman says it, he's at the Palantir. Like, did we yeah. know this Miller? That was like one interesting one I thought could be a possibility. Oh, that's the one when Durham was saying something yeah. like, uh, and it just sounded like a normal yeah. sentence that we would say, but just without the word middle. Like, yeah. in, uh, the like, greatest thing on this earth was what we yes. would say. And he was like, the greatest thing on this middle earth. I was like, oh, he yes. just introduced the word middle there. Yes. So that was kind of cool. <laughs> but there is one point, I'll just, I may as well just say it now, but where it's in a few moments where we speak, where we meet uh, Celebrimbor again in Region, and he says, isn't that odd? And I was like, that's what Bilbo says when he's holding the <laughs> ring. He's like, isn't that odd now? And I was like, just like little things like that. I'm like, oh, all right, that's, that just like makes me think about I, Bilbo in, in Hobbiton. Maybe. I suppose it's a bit of a stretch. It's like if someone says hello a bit of a and you're like, oh, hello. Aragorn said that in, in some book. <laughs> well, I've never said, isn't that odd? I don't think. Uh, in yeah. My, isn't that in odd now? Yeah. So okay. Just, yeah. Yeah. You're right. You're right. Um, never mind. Yeah, so like we get to see, uh, speaking of rations as well, this is the reason why Theo comes up with the idea to go back to the village and mm-hmm. bring his friend, is it Ramen or Rowan? Ram. I think it's Rowan. <laughs> Rowan. He brings, Rowan. Rowan. He brings Rowan to, to the town and then, yeah, we get to see this lovely scene play out with uh, Jed Brophy. Johnny, would you like to, or no, Harry this time. What did you make of this scene? It. They do like their jump scares, don't they, with the orcs? Yeah. I think the first one, it just comes as like behind your head, like right in your face. And I think... A shadow was, of the past. Mm-hmm. A shadow, <laughs> yeah. And I think it's interesting because the the big thing about that scene, with the one with Jed Brophy, he's always great as an orc. So, so amazing Brilliant, seeing him yeah. on screen. The sword, when that came out, you just seem like... It's like, I, I, I don't have to say it's like, it's like you know, when you, you're older and you just taking like a drug or something he did eject it it's like he's doing that but with a sword and like yeah. he's going and it's attacking them and it's like it's very interesting because later on we learn from um Wardreg, who for some reason has this sword beforehand that it's a power and you're seeing how the orcs are like okay they've been after this for a while so it does have some importance but practically the whole scene itself the fight was um it was pretty, pretty intense. But one thing I will say, and one thing I have a little gripe with, is I just don't get how it was possible that Theo survived coming out of that well, going to Ronde. I think all the obstacles that he so conveniently got past is like a little bit. It's like it's like like I think yeah, we talk about Game of Thrones. It's like it's like season eight that Battle of Winterfell where like plot armor like everybody else, like all the main characters basically survive, and it's like the same thing here. It's like he somehow you know. Like, just mm. done some Jason Bourne, James Bond across, like, a whole village with orcs that you're walking right past. And I was like, that's a bit... But except from that, the orcs, again, yeah, they were great. Mm. And a lot of that was kind of off-screen as well, where mm-hmm. it shows them sneaking around a yeah. bit, and you hear the orcs saying, like, fan yeah. out, we're yeah. gonna... You know, no one sleeps until this guy's found, and then somehow he's, like, running with his mate around here. Um, yeah, there's a couple of things... There's a couple of things in this show... I suppose when they showed Celebrimbor first talk, we'll get onto it. They showed Celebrimbor first talking to Elrond, and then the next scene we just see Elrond back in um, Casa Doom, and I'm like, well, that. How long does that take? That takes probably months to just travel from one place to the other. But they just seem to be kind of skipping things. In, There's I no think travel I, time at all. The first time that we saw in episode two, when we saw them traveling, and it showed on the map, it showed like the dot going mm. from. Uh, and and I was like, Irregular and then it, and, and then it. yeah, and then it just clips in and it show, and it, it seems like Elrond and Celebrimbor were just out for an afternoon stroll to yeah. get there. And I was like, how how long have they been walking? You know, they're just yeah. and Celebrimbor was just you know 
in the same clothes as he'd been wearing in the previous scene and so it may be it, they're making it seem like that distance is just mm. like I, well it, it is quite close to but, yeah, see, it, for yeah. middle earth it is quite good like yeah. if it's from like Linden, but still it, yeah but i understand but, like, yeah, but, but, still, but it must like, take a couple take, of days i'd say a mm-hmm. couple of days and it, i don't think they just they aren't they aren't showing any of the travel at all it's just kind of those are the things that make the world feel a little bit smaller at the time when it's when he's just having a conversation with Keller Brimbor here and then the next scene he's over with the dwarves and you're like, well, hmm. is, is this the same city or what? Like for people that don't understand, like this is a different kingdom altogether. I just think they should include some travel scenes. But, um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but Montage anyways. of them on the road with a little song. <laughs> yeah. Well, that'd be class, actually. This would be a great um, place to put in some yeah. songs from the books. But, uh, I, yeah, that's true. I thought it was cool though when going back to Theo and the knife thing. I think I thought it was cool mm. that he now knows how to use the knife, and he's like, "Okay, I need yeah, to, it, it the knife needs blood if you yeah. want to get it to work." So that was kind of cool. Bit of a callback to Gurthang, maybe the mm. fact that it you know drinks the, drink blood the blood. To, yeah. yeah, I don't know. It's probably got nothing to do with it, but and it's interesting in this scene how. Well, it's not interesting, but we theorized in it last week. What are the orcs looking for? And most people did say the sword, but they've said they finally say like we found it. It. I actually don't think they said it's with the boy. I think they said it's the boy. Um, I don't know. Did does they? that? I thought they said I'm, it's uh, us, Tirith. I think is what they said. There's they did. That, yeah, they said at they, the end. Yeah, they, they say that later. Sure. But like at this moment when Theo's in the well, I think Jed Brophy is like. Mm. We found it. It's the boy. And I think they just meant like, you know, look yeah. for the boy because he's the one that has it. But they don't say it's with the boy. They just say, mm-hmm. anyways, could be. that Who doesn't, knows? that doesn't really matter. But um, Maybe anyways, moving on to the next scene is where we actually get to see a region. And this was a nice shot of the, this forge being built. And we see elves and dwarves working together, uh, which is nice. Celebrimbor says Ariende, Ariendil mentioned that his future would be in the hands of Elrond's son. No, did I get that wrong? Of his son, which is our one. Of I his think. son, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, um, Ariendil's son is Elrond. So what did you what did you make of this scene, John? Did you enjoy? I love the dialogue um, at first, but like, what did yeah, you take I, away from um, this scene? Well, first of all, I was a little bit confused that we kind of just have skipped over any sort of the dwarves agreeing to actually uh, work with the elves. We didn't get to see that. We didn't get to see them, you know, um, building their big uh, group of, well, just like saying, okay, we're going to send out this legion of dwarves to go and do it. I thought that was going to happen. I thought we were going to see that. So a little bit sad that we kind of brushed over that. And now suddenly they're just well into months of construction or maybe I don't know how long they're in, but it looked like they've built quite a lot they've got all the foundations done they're halfway up the tower so mm. um well, i don't know how tall it's going to be i don't know if it's halfway up but they've definitely they're well into the, the construction process so it seems like they're you know they've been doing it for quite a while now i would imagine so i wanted to maybe see that process but i understand that they kind of need to speed things along but um i also think that charles edwards was really good again very uh very convincing as keller Brimbor. and I think, yeah, I think any sort of doubts that people kind of had of him before are kind of slowly washing away, like the fruit <laughs> of Saruman. Um, so so uh, I think that was cool as well. Uh, I love, I loved all the mentions. There were quite a few mentions, uh, like little name drops in this episode. You mentioned uh, Olaf Druin yeah. earlier. This one, I uh, mentioning uh, Erendil, and I was like, oh, that's so, that's so cool. I was like already excited. And then later on, we get the whole story of Erendil, and I was like, this is incredible. So I really enjoyed um, just hearing that name drop and how he remembers this thing that uh, what Erendil had said to him. And just to mention that his, he's saying, your father was very far-sighted like you as well. So yeah, we kind of get that cool. as well. So, so that was really cool. I liked that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Harry, any other thoughts on this scene? Oh, uh, that scene. Um, I, I'm, I'm a bit confused as to what he means by, you know, his fate of his son is that, but I think overall that I, the I did message around it. I totally get, and I really do like that. I think, I think J D. Payne and Patrick McKay did write the, this episode. There's like I calculated afterwards. There's three and a half. I, I say three and a half, but there's basically three Erendel name, like Erendel references and name drops within this episode lo- alone. And there's one in the last episode, so he does seem to be, you know, a prominent figure. For mm. for them, and I just it it was a nice touch. I think it shows the I think they're trying to show the more you know the gentleness, the 
the more reserved nature of Calabrimbo whenever he's with Elwand. But still, Elwand, I, he's still for me. He's the MVP of the show right now. He's, he's. I'd like to say what I thought Galadriel would be, but a bit more oomph, of course. Because I was always expecting she was going to be more. She was going to be, you know, quite is, quite you know, don't say rageful, but like she, she's quite out there. But Elwand has that because one thing I liked about episode one. If you see Elrond, and when they say he he's not permitted to the the meeting, is Elf Lords only, you can see frustration, but he's like, hmm, okay, yeah. I understand. But then, like, if you had Galadriel in that situation, he'd be like, she'd be like, there's a tempest in yeah, me. There, there's a tempest <laughs> in me. There's a council in me. Like, I want to go to that council. It's like, it, yeah. it's that nice thing I like, and you see it in these scenes, and I think... I think you're right when you're saying there's not a lot of like walking scenes and having that time to just be reserved for a bit. And I think for me, those type of scenes are the ones that like not fully compensate, but they're like the placeholder. As in, you know, sitting down, just discussing, you know, letting everything else happen around. So that's what I do really like most about those scenes. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with you there. Um, I do like seeing Elrond slightly frustrated, but yeah. not really showing it and just being... Very in control of his emotions, which mm. is very elf-like. Um, we see him then straight away in the next scene where he's with Durin. Or sorry, no, he's with Disa. Disa. And, he, and yeah. he's questioning her about Durin's whereabouts and she's kind of covering for him. And uh, yeah, that's quite interesting because he's he definitely thinks Durin is up to something, which he is. And uh, yeah, Johnny, what do you make of this? Getting to see Disa cover um, for Dorin. yeah first of all i i, I love disa i think she's fantastic uh, yeah me too all, i i think i have just have a smile on my face every time she's on the screen <laughs> and so that's a you know a credit to her and sophia uh, no, yeah. Nomvete. she's uh she's doing a fantastic job i'm really really happy with how that character is playing out um i was a bit unclear as to why um elrond needed to question her and what's actually happening? Like, is Durin just going missing for weeks at a time or something? Or what's... Uh, what I, was think, the real... I think the elves in general are... Well, the elves... Elrond is suspicious of something, uh, which I thought was interesting. He's suspicious of Durin. Mm-hmm. And I think it's the think? Mithril, I think, is the main thing because they're trying to mine for it. And he's, you know... I feel like in this Elrond-Durin relationship, I feel like Elrond is on the more, you know... The, don't say the right side, but like it feels like for a bit when we when he goes and does find out why Duran's been hiding himself away for, for a bit, it's because of the mythal and the mining it. So I feel like he is trying. I think I think Duran is one who's trying to more hide stuff than L one. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, oh, yeah I, think, I think that's maybe because of his father whispering in his ear and yeah. saying, "Don't trust the elves," and you should. Mm. Now yeah. maybe I I asked a question a moment ago, but I think I may have realized the answer, and it, it, because I was saying, why is Durin disappearing for long periods of time, which is, it seems to be that that's, that's what was going on. Um, again, I think it may be that again. I we, I just saw the episode like just for so I haven't really had time to, uh, you know, let let the information sink in or to to think about it too much. But maybe it was because because of what his father had said that they could only have like these very small groups going in, mm. and so he was kind of leading all the groups going in, and so maybe he needed to be there like as much as possible, mm-hmm. and so. Maybe for that reason, Elrond was trying to get him to come and oversee the work that was going on in, in uh, Eregion, and he was just avoiding that. So that's yeah, that could have been something maybe, like yeah. that. But... Yeah, maybe it's the fact that Doran hasn't been to Linden in this time, and yeah. Elrond's like, what the hell? He's supposed to be taking charge of this. But, um, but yeah, he didn't need to go to Linden for it, though, I'm sure. It was just like to go to... Or sorry, to Eregion, I mean. Uh, Eregion, oh, right, sorry, yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I really enjoyed Disa having an answer for every question that <laughs> Elrond posed to her, which was quite funny. Um, yeah. But then the the cool the cool thing was getting to see Disa and Durin together and kind of yeah, loudly yeah. talking about ha 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 this is why yeah. we uh, yeah. we're not telling Elrond anything and we don't really trust him and blah 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 or we don't trust the elves and then Elrond uses yeah. his far sightedness and this is like the first time we get to see any real elf magic in the show like I I can't think of another time where Use we get big to see old elf ears. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and his elf eyes, and the camera pans in a way that you see his far sightedness, and he goes mirror me, which was quite interesting. Oh, lo- again, that's I, I've like on my yeah. page, I've about five things that I wrote down that were that I've actually <laughs> highlighted, and they're all just like a uh, uh, Orodruin mirror mirror 
ARN deal and things like that. I was like, yeah, oh, so cool to just hear these words yeah. in um, in the show. Yeah, that, true. That shot was kind of like a Batman or Spider Man <clears throat> shot. It's like he's like it's like you know think of Batman on top of Gotham and he's yeah. like just going like that as well. But I think for the <laughs> far sightedness, I think. <laughs> We actually kind of saw it before because I, I did rewatch to make sure. But when you actually see um, the tower and Elvin's looking from the window, he said, "Oh, elves and dwarves work together." There, there's not one elf or one dwarf from that tower anywhere. So unless on the yeah. other side of that, really, they're really said so from a normal visible eye, you cannot see it. That's another example of him. He's him using his. <laughs> okay, I just oh, thought that. Cool. I just thought that like he knew that, that this is what had happened and he was looking at the mm. progress and he was like, oh, who would have thought elves and dwarves mm. like the same way that if, if we just stumbled upon a huge building now and somebody said this was built by uh, elves and dwarves, you'd be like, wow, elves and dwarves working together. Who would have thought? Yeah. Uh, I thought, I thought it was like a throw, throwaway comment at that. But also, yeah, you just said a kind of a Batman thing. I, I was going to yeah. say it reminded me of like a Hawkeye mm. kind of thing where we see him just like, yeah. crouching from really far away and he's spying uh, this like, you know, he's zooming in with his hawk-like eyes. But um, yeah, it was cool. It's funny when you said like Batman or Spider-Man mm. as well because the way the camera actually changes from one uh, shot to another it, it kind of reminded me of like a, a video game where you're getting to see a cutscene and then it like yeah. comes back and then it's like <laughs> now I'm the playable character and you get to jump off the building and do whatever yeah the one thing I thought was stupid though then the very next shot where Elrond goes to investigate and he just guesses the password and I know the password was like the children's song but he heard this one time and he's like that means a lot to Dura and I'm just going to guess this and maybe he's using mm. some elvish wisdom and maybe a bit of magic there to come up with yeah. the password but like that did that not take you guys by surprise yeah it, it took me by surprise but it also kind of I don't know I, I just some lot lots of things you have to just accept yeah. that okay it's, he's an yeah. elf he's been around for thousands of years he knows how things go and I was like yeah like you said just elven wisdom he kind of figured it out or maybe that's a song that has more meaning that we don't know mm. about yet. But um, I don't know. What were you going to say, Harry? I was saying for me, I just compare it to, you know, episode three, Halbrand somehow having tokens to have, to have drinks for the entire Numenorean, you know. We said that too, yeah. Shit. I was like, yeah, it's, it's yeah. one of those ones. Is like the logic may not be there, but sure. it's like a television thing. Like, you know, for example, going from Eregio into Casa Doom in like five minutes, like in like... Oh, yeah. yeah. Also, mm. there, there was another one yeah. in this episode as well mm -hmm. at the beginning that I forgot to mention when... Farazan was like giving his speech and then he kind of just goes drinks for all I was yeah. like we're not even oh. in a bar and then these women just appeared with like all these glasses of readily poured wine I was like do they just follow him around in case he wants to offer yeah. drinks to mm. you know the entire uh, group he of must be a so. raging alcoholic if that's the case <laughs> yeah. he just has like loads of women carrying drinks make but sure you follow I, me with at least 50 liters of wine <laughs> <laughs> I was going to bring that up I thought that was brilliant he's like right uh, I'm going to get all these men on my side he kind of says something 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 Numenor is an island of men Drinks for everyone. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. hey. I vote for him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I thought that was cool. But anyways, in this scene, we get to see Mithril for the first time. Um, and Durin makes Elrond swear an oath. And then I thought a line that was cool was when he said, Dwarven anger outlives elven memory. And uh, yeah, I thought mm. that was pretty sweet. And then he ends up gifting this piece of Mithril to Elrond as a token of friendship. Did you, what did you think of nice. this, John? Yeah, I liked that, that he gifted it to him in the end. And it shows that he's now, you know, he fully trusts Elrond uh, as opposed to a couple of episodes ago when he, hmm. you know, well, the initial kind of little tiff that he had with Elrond. And then, you know, he finally, you know, invited him into his home, but he still was like, but I'm still angry and I still, still whatever, still held that resentment. But now it looks like he's, it, we've, you know, we've gotten uh, way past that. He completely uh, trusts Elrond enough to give him this Mithril. And again, uh, there's another mention of Erendil where Elrond swears on uh, the memory of his father Erendil yeah. and that was really nice as well and it's cool that like Durin being a dwarf swears on the stone yeah so um, yeah that just like cool. I love I'm, I'm really loving all the little moments in Casa Doom and just the way we see their culture playing out and it just feels so real like this is what they will do later on when we get to see Deesa singing and just everything about Casa Doom is just so cool yeah, and getting these shots of Mithril for the first time, I thought it actually looked as we fantastic. predicted. It was Mithril. Yeah, as predicted, but it was nice that you know it wasn't. 
it's one of those things where I kind of felt like it's obviously Mithril. I hope they don't make it to be this big secret that lasts a season or two seasons. But sure. yeah, yeah, we we got that reveal and it was quite cool as well when he was holding it up and he's like, the light reflects off it as, almost as if it's coming from within. So mm. yeah, so yeah, we felt like we a Silmaril. Some, yeah, yeah, almost. Um, so yeah, we got some uh, great shots there. I think the next scene cuts back to Aarian and Kemen talking about dinner going for dinner and stuff so um i don't know if anyone has anything to say about that chime in now but i yeah that was kind of yeah. boring um yeah. so the next one is galadriel actually escapes uh from her prison and mm-hmm. tar palin and we get to see tar palantir she sneaks up this is another one how the hell did she yeah. climb this huge tower and just like She's break in elf. the window i know but is she a monkey elf or well, no. we saw her climbing an ice wall in the very opening shot. That's of true. The, you know, so, I mean, yeah. she's able to scale that. This must have been a piece of cake. Foreshadowing. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, so, Harry, in this scene, we get to see the Palantir. But, uh, I don't know, did you guys catch it? I'm pretty sure I saw the sword of Narsil. Johnny, you said last week's episode, Elendil pulling out Narsil's sword. And I was like, oh, I hope not. But the exact same sword that's in the... Peter Jackson movies, Aragorn's one, Narsil. Is... is that the one that was like leaning up against yeah. the wall? Yeah, it? but it was. It looked, I, I it looked cop, golden. And cop it. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure it, it looks the exact same. Mm, so, I, oh, it, it does. It really does look um, similar. I think that wasn't the only thing that was of interest in that room. You see. Um, there was a Palantir. <laughs> what else? Yeah. What else there was was two Palantirs. Yeah. Tar Palantir. Mm. Oh, that's true. There was. A painting which had Beren and Luthien in it. Oh, with, cool. um, I think it's Beren holding a silver. Actually, no, Luthien holding a silver medal. And then um, you get to see um, Tor's axe as well. I did see an axe. Leg, I think that that people are speculating it could be that as well. So that's just like a law filled room. Like, oh, class. Wow. Yeah. Need to go back I did and not, watch this. I, yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah. That one watch through is not enough. You need. To, oh, it was not. Uh, yeah, I need to go back and watch it a few more times. Tours acts. Um, what's wow, the name of it? That would be so cool. Tremble leg, and that's supposed to be like uh, some sort one of heirloom sang left however in however many times, mm-hmm. and it's an heirloom of uh, Numenor, or it's like you know it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be in Numenor. Um, or, it possibly. would <laughs> it would make sense because it is from the descendants of men and tourism. Man, so it would make sense, you know. Like, the, for example, the Ringo Barra here would definitely be there. Like, I'm surprised we haven't seen that oh, yet. Yeah. That would mm. definitely be here somewhere. But I could see it's like, you so, know, a little nod or reference over. So that's really yeah. cool. That's really but cool. um, but anyways, Harry, this scene with the the Palantir. What did you What did you make of this? First, getting to meet Tara mm. Palantir. Yeah, we'll say which Palantir. See... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So first, we meet Tara Palantir, and then we get to meet Ball Palantir, and we get another <laughs> premonition of Numenor. Except Galadriel is is the avatar in this game. So, what did you What did you make of this? Well, for Palantir one, it was interesting that he's blind. Bath was blind for that part, and how sick he's become, and it just it seems like I think all, in, all he said in that scene was Maria, so it seems like he has limited speech as well. But I think it was again it's you, you, you sometimes you know you want to root for Galadriel, you know she's the main character, but she's walking in, going, you know, or oh, finally being able to speak with the true ruler. You just see Miriel yeah. then, you're just like, oh, <laughs> like, yeah. it's, it's like you got that spoiled Awkward. brat vibe. It's like you know, like, but then they, but they, they actually mend their relationship quite quickly because Miriel yeah. takes mm. him and um, her up the tower, and then they, you know, they see Palantir, and then it's interesting that. Again, I think one of you mentioned it earlier. It's like Galadriel's convincing nature is not that strong. Cause like you're in a position where you're literally showing the downfall of Numenor and how she was not able to convince Midian in that moment that, you know, you need to come to Middle Earth to stop this. It was mm. quite interesting, but they did seem like they were, by the end, they were on the same page. And I think that was the most important thing of that scene is, um, Midian and Galadriel, right? Them both realizing that, okay, even though I'm not going to admit it now, we're going to need to work together in this. And then in the next scene, you know, the next few scenes, it ends up happening. So I think that was a really mm. nice thing. And see, again, having... It's interesting that Palante, I think you said it started just on repeat, the same the same scene over and over again. It's like, do you know what I don't get? Why don't you just show Fadazon, you know, show him the scene 
on the Palantir. Doesn't that like solve all the problems? <laughs> like a little plot. Uh, hole. Yeah. Well, then we'd have no story. Yeah. For, yeah. But yeah, that's true. I, I, but what I would like to say also, I'd like to mention that the fact that we found out that Muriel's father is actually Tar Palantir, that is really cool and really important because it kind of means that they are following, they are being faithful to the timeline, regardless of the fact that there is going to be a timeline compression because we know that her father is supposed to be Tar Palantir. And we know that also in the previous episode, she said that, uh, my grandfather's great grandfather. Uh, this is like elves have not been oh, since then, cool. and 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 that is correct as well. That that was like that is the way that it's played out. So, in terms of where we are in Numenor's history, we are exactly where we should be in terms of the timeline. Oh yeah, so that's kind of cool. That's correct. And yeah? I think uh, one thing I forgot, I totally glossed <laughs> over, it, 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 in the, in the law. Tar Palantir has a vision whereby, not a vision, but he, he has foresight, and it's whereby he sees, he says that, and this even relates to the Third Age, that when the petals of the, well, I think when the leaves and the white tree starts to diminish, so will the line of kings of Numenor. So that is, so in the law, that is what he said, and what they've done mm. here, they've built on that, so that still works. That when the because the petals falling was a big symbol in this episode, a big metaphor, but they've also made it a prophecy. So they've changed his foresight into a actual prophecy, and then they've added Galadriel mm. in there. I so I I like how they've like adapted that part of canon that we actually do know about Tar Plant in that period, which was quite nice. Yeah, mm. very nice. Yeah, um, that was really cool. So yeah, again, this scene, I I thought the dialogue between Muriel and Galadriel was quite good. Um, but let's let's keep moving on. The next well, one we just, get. Oh, sorry, sorry I just I just one thing I wanted to say about that, which was that I'm I was actually surprised when I saw that scene that I, when what, what we saw in the trailers of Galadriel and Muriel together up in the tower and sh- uh, Muriel showing her the Palantir. I thought that that meant that what we've seen of Muriel in the previous episode, uh, she was, you know, kind of putting on a front to pretend that she was, you know, like, yeah. you know obeying the, the rules of Numenor, but really secretly she was faithful. And then I thought this is where the moment she was like, oh my God, Galadriel, I have to tell you all this stuff. And, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I'm on your side. But it, it wasn't that way. And it's still, it's like she still showed her some of the visions. But when Galadriel was saying, okay, great. Now, you know, we're on the same team. We need to go. And she was like, no, I, I can't do that. Like, she's like, you know, um, faith is maybe enough to convince one person's heart, but it's not enough to hang a kingdom from or something. Oh, yeah. I can't remember the exact yeah. line. Mm-hmm. But that, that was, was a really cool. nice line. I think in terms of which one of these two women has got better, um, you know, like we've we've just mentioned it again a moment ago, little Harry did, about like being able to convince people with their words and just being a really good speaker and good at giving, you know, just, you know, rallying up the crowd. Muriel seems to be much better than Galadriel, like mm-hmm. that, which is a little bit strange. She's convinced me. Opposite, but <laughs> yeah. She's convinced me. Yeah, it's yeah. probably because she's not slagging off half the audience, I think, in the room. That's probably why <laughs> <laughs> she's doing better. But, yeah, no, I do agree. Yeah. Yeah, I think your point is right that Muriel, she, she, there's, there's a sense of calmness within her. Like, even when Galadriel yeah. is saying all that, she's still reserved. She's still, yeah. she, she, you, yeah. she's a ruler. I think that's what you can get sure. from that. Mm-hmm. And, and as we should also remember that she's a ruler of Numenorean uh, descent. So, I mean, you could think of the wisest king or queen or rulers that we have in our day, like in our world today, and think: imagine this person was in power for however length of time that she is. She could be, you know, one hundred and fifty years old. We don't know. So, well, maybe a hundred years old or something like that. So, if their lifespan at this time was around two hundred and something years she could easily be someone that's been in this position of power for a long, long time. So she should be wise and she should be well able to deal with these types of situations. So that's something as well that we should think. She's not just like mm-hmm. some, you know, 40 year old woman or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And you do get a sense of understanding between the, the two characters, but at the end of the day, Muriel is like, look, I'm trying to lead this kingdom and I can't. And she's go scared. Yeah. She is scared. And Galadriel brings yeah. that up. She's like, D- you know, do not follow your fear. Like, yeah, yeah. Follow your faith, but yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It was it was a good scene. And Johnny, you mentioned earlier how the trailer led us to believe one thing, but again, th- that's because they showed Galadriel and uh, Muriel at the Palantir, and they used the line of Muriel talking to her father, where she says, "It is here, Galadriel, the moment that we yeah. feared." Even yeah, though exactly, that was yeah. just kind of 
taken out of context completely. Yeah, they're being awful sneaky. Very sneaky, but I'm glad that's the case. Um, yeah. I so like the, ne- the next scene we get is Theo finally getting out of the well, creeping around, and then he bumps into um, Vrath is the name of the orc. And then Vrath is immediately killed by Arondir, which is cool. So R.I.P. Vrath. Um, and then they have this big chase scene that we saw in the in the trailer and the catching of the arrow. And then they have this Mexican standoff in the sunshine, which was, which was all was nice and good. What did you, what did so you think nice. of this scene, Harry? Did you enjoy the action? I did enjoy the action. I just, again, Aronda was like doing this for like 30 seconds. I was like, wondering, they did have bow and arrows. And I was wondering, like, it is always, yeah. I think every, I think like when you watch Star Wars, anything, like whenever there's something like that happening, you're like, just shoot an arrow, I think. But I think, you know, when it's television, when it's fantasy, you know, you, you there, there, those leeways. But I think overall, like, minus that, it was, it was, I think, the wide shot when you just see, um, Bonwin, um, Aronde and Theo, then you see the orcs on the other side, and then this bump back here. And that was a really nice. You see the sun beaming in. Cause, that was yeah. so gorgeous, yeah. And, and the music that came in at that mm-hmm, point as well. Mm-hmm. And I think they're doing a yeah. really big metaphor and like, a big symbol about the sun and how the light and how that's affecting them because the orcs couldn't come out. And it's like, you know, light versus dark. You see that motif there as well. That yeah. it, There's so many layers to it. But I, yeah, over, I did really enjoy it. And I just don't get how, you know, again, again we go back to like the technicalities, like when Arond is in the forest, like how the orcs have not caught up to Theo, first of all, I'm, I'm no guess. And how, <laughs> you know, he just sits there and just kills one orc. Like what difference did that make? Killing that one orc. It's like, it made no difference. They still kept running. There's still like hundreds of them. But... Except from that, it was, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Johnny, any any other notes yeah, on the scene? Similar things, I suppose, yeah, they probably should have caught up with them. That was a little bit yeah. silly. And also, just that one shot of Arondir catching the arrow that we've seen many, many times, I just don't understand the flight of the arrow. It's like coming down at this angle as if it's being like lofted up in the air. Yeah. And coming it's down like and you can't it. do that inside it. You can't do that in a yeah. forest. So... Maybe I mean, somebody if just it was threw coming... the arrow. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> maybe they've got a child orc with them that just like has it is like little pea shooter yeah. uh, bow and arrow thing or something. Just like woo. But um, I was just I didn't understand the flight of that arrow. And I mean, it is cool that like you know he catches it, he saves Steel's life because it's gonna hit him, and he spins around and shoots it. But also he spins around and they do this like close up on his face, and it takes him a good another like five six seconds to like release the string. And again, you're like, quick, hurry yeah. up! They're 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 gaining on you. And like you said, Harry, there, he just, well done. You've killed one. Yeah, what's it done? The, they're the, still the, running the, at you. The other, yeah, the other ninety nine are just, you know, they've been gaining on you that entire. You've just time. angered them even yeah. more. It's basically what you've done. <laughs> yeah, it's like at Helm's yeah. Deep when the archer just <laughs> shoots at one arc. Oh yeah, like, yeah, yeah you've just pissed them off now. Basically, is what I, happened. I love that. Mm, love, love that. that. Yeah. Rest in peace to but, that. Guy, uh, yeah. So. Yeah, and again, of course, yeah, I, I don't it comes out. Now, I will say that the first few orcs that, like, arrived, none of them looked like they were holding bows and arrows. So maybe they're waiting for the archers mm-hmm. to catch up because then when they actually ran away, you could see a few yeah. arrows um, yeah. landing and they couldn't reach that far. But I just, like, I for me, that entire scene, just the the main thing about it was just the beauty, the beauty of the way yeah. it was shot. And it was just so gorgeous. And as I said, that, again, the, for me, anytime I see a gorgeous scene, just like the music is always adding to it uh, from what I've seen so far. And that was the case here again. So really, really class. But yeah, nothing else to say here. Yeah, that scene, I think um, you both mentioned how it was weird that the orcs didn't catch up. I just assumed that was the whole point of Arondir. Arondir is with him the whole time. So I assumed he would kill off any orcs that got close and then they'd run a bit. And so that that's what was going through my it's mind. giving so him a piggyback. A, a little bit, yeah. But anyways, uh, on to the next scene. Uh, well, actually, Johnny, you mentioned it earlier that this most of the scene was actually shot in slow motion, um, like the orcs and Aaron Deere catching the arrow and stuff. And then there was just that backdrop of the music with, yeah, it was actually Disa singing. And we straight away mm. cut into that Disa singing to the mountain. She's basically, this is kind of her way of praying that the miners uh, don't get killed, the ones that are trapped in the mountain. And that was another lovely little insight to the d- dwarvish culture there. So um, yeah. what, did you, what did you make of that, John? You, did you enjoy this Loved scene? it. Yeah. yeah, I loved it. I've been looking forward to this scene of seeing this resonating uh, process since we saw the first clip of it in the trailers. I just, I've just been really excited to see how does the process go uh, of, you know, singing. It's, it's, it's sort of like ritualistic uh, process. 
uh, and we could see it's kind of uh, religious almost as well, that they were singing and uh, the whole mountain at one point or a certain part of it started to almost, you know, vibrate and, you know, resonate, I suppose. And mm. that was just really, really cool. I I really loved it. It was, um, and whoever whoever's voice it is, that's I'm assuming that's not, the actress's voice. No, I think it is. It is. I think it is. She's a singer. Do you think so? She did theatre. So, yeah. She did theatre for a while. She so. did theatre? Yeah. Okay. Well, if that's her voice, that's incredible. Yeah. Oh, no, it is, because she's, she's um, credited on the album, so I think it has to be. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. Well, that's class. That's amazing. That's amazing. Cool. I didn't, didn't know that, but yeah, it was such a, she's got such a powerful voice, and it was such a powerful scene, and this is also where, where Duran storms in and he's full of rage and Elrond's there and he's like oh, I don't ever want to you know share breath with that man anymore talking about his the father. old goat he's yeah like, the I old like, goat yeah. The, I was like that's a compliment yeah exactly. yeah and then we get yeah, another please. shout out uh, to Eirendil by Elrond talking about his own father and he gives a lovely little story about his own father and then basically turns to Durin and says but I wish that I could still talk to him and you know relish those moments with your father and it was it was such a nice scene because I kind of was like where the hell is Elrond going with this he's just talking about how amazing his dad is uh, after doing <laughs> yeah. his, insulting his old goat of a father but uh, yeah I thought that was a really really sweet scene um, so what did you think of it Harry? I think again uh, Elrond has been given I think thanks to the writings so he's been given the more you know the heartfelt scenes the ones that really hit home and I really do mm. and I think it's, it's just part of the strong point of the show is the Elrond do and I think you can even add decent to that as well yeah even across yeah. the Elrond do and do I think it's fair to add decent to the mix as well I think those three mm. I think you just see the strength and you know and you can really see the emotion in their in their friendship in their relationship and I'm not talking about Durin and Deesa, I'm talking about Durin and Elrond. I think you really yeah, see right. that, you saw the exchange, or, you know, you keep that. Mm. Um, and we actually seen that quite a bit in the show. We had Nordi leaving, you know, giving the berry, I think leaving the snail to the other half of it in the first episode. But, yeah, back to, to, to Durin, I think I did really like how Elrond used his... I re- you could see him getting emotional almost, and... The part where he speaks about almost not living up to expectations, and that's the where that's like where Duran is. I nearly got him for a second, which I liked, but then he was able to overcome that and say, "But then I realized just spending. I just wished now just to spend and have time to chat with my father." And then when you hit that, and that's when it hit home for Duran. I liked that part where he almost nearly fell into his own trap, like the message he's trying to send. Then you got over it and then gave it. And I think that was a really nice touch. Yeah, yeah. this was the the best scene for me mm-hmm. in in the episode. I um I absolutely loved it, and I think yeah, you're you're right that the the MVP uh, is Elrond. So the far, goat. He's, he's the actual yeah, goat. Yeah, he's he's <laughs> yeah. the old goat. The, the old goat. Goat talking about. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that the way that they played, I think the writing was incredible in this scene. Yeah. The way that they had Elrond just sort of come in no context talking about how great uh, his father was and he was the greatest ever and he went on his own to Valinor and he got uh, all the Valor to come defeat Morgoth and now he's sailing the skies and then you're like where are you, where are you going with this? Yeah that's what and, I thought. Uh, I mean it was strange and then he brings it home uh, as well and uh, it was so moving and I definitely I welled up uh, watching that scene I, I was like so um, it was just so emotional and so well delivered mm-hmm. but then Immediately, then uh, Disa asks, "Oh, and uh, can you like clear this up for me? How did you guys meet?" And they went into this little story, and again, that had me giggling like a yeah. moment later, while I still was like tears in my eyes almost. And I kind of it reminded me almost of how, like nowadays, any sort of Marvel movie, anytime there's this kind of like you know emotional moment, they throw it off with this kind of joke. And I was like, this did it so much better than any of that kind of stuff before because it just it felt real rather than just kind of some like cheeky quip or mm. something like that i think that Marvel it's a joke kind of someone people... would make after a situation like that is i think yeah, yeah, yeah that's exactly. true yeah it's the, the yeah it was very it felt real it, it did feel real, real. And, oh i, and I yeah, absolutely it... i i more than giggled i 
yelled out yeah. when when <laughs> when Elrond was just like, "Your screams were so high, I thought it was a, a child." And then he was like, "That yeah. was a battle cry, <laughs> a, a battle yeah. cry." Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, awesome. I was actually like roaring, and it's, it, you're right, yeah. Harry. It felt so believable. Like that didn't seem like a funny quip that some you know Marvel writers mm. wrote and was very clever. It was just like that was a real conversation, and it it perfectly contradicted the the sadness or the kind of I don't know the the emotions yeah, that we felt in the it previous yeah, it complimented. Sorry, it complimented. and then yeah, yeah it, and yeah. it was like it was like so like heartfelt and then we had this really like kind of you know break the tension moment and then we went back into another heartfelt moment where he actually speaks to his father and he yes. apologizes and then his father's like you've got nothing to to apologize for exactly uh, there's yeah. nothing to forgive and I'll be with you always, my son, kind of thing. And I was like, oh, my God, this is just too much emotion. I can't deal with it. So um, it's great to see I, that from yeah, the dwarves, it was, isn't it? I, re- I think we didn't get that much from King Durin uh, in previous episodes. And he was fantastic in this episode yeah. as well. He really it's, it's just brilliant. feels like a real dwarven king. Like his, we, got, we, saw, we already saw his appearance before and he just he looks the part. But now the way he spoke as well was, you know, He's, he's strong and he said like you know I'm with you always uh, even in anger and he's like sometimes mostly in anger and so mm. you can see you can tell like he's got that typical you know dwarven fieriness inside him but he also obviously clearly has huge love for his son so and obviously his family and his and his race so uh, yeah I am um, took it away and um, you know I thought I, that was just fantastic you're absolutely right like I loved those scenes and they did feel very heartfelt but I do feel like underneath it all there's a small bit of manipulation going on between Durin and Hmm. Durin the fourth and Durin the third just like he's had this big heartfelt conversation and then he talks to Durin and he's like you know what what do you think of the elves do you think do you think you should go to Linden and he's like I think they're up to something he's like that's my boy he's like go go to Linden and like it's kind of like he's pulling the strings a little bit I don't know if that's the case Uh, we'll, we'll see in later episodes but mm. um, yeah, I thought that was an interesting chat between the two Durans. And now Duran, the fourth, is going to Linden, whether he originally wanted to or not, uh, to kind of spy on the elves. So what do you think of this, Harry? Do you think that's what he's going to do? Or do you think he just wanted an excuse to go visit his friend? I Ireland? think it's going to lead to that dinner scene. I think that's what we are getting yeah, towards. Yeah, of course. And I think, and I'm thinking maybe... That Mithril might Mithril might become a little, you know, talking point during that scene. I think maybe Durin might let it slip because mm. you see when in the glass, Celebrimbor and Durin have their glasses raised with each other. You know, Celebrimbor with some of the forging of the rings. I think Mithril was used for some of the for some rings for ring making. So Galadriel's yeah, ring, Galadriel, Galadriel's yeah. ring has Mithril. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I th- the, the ring of adamant. Yeah. And I think that could be a nice little way that's going to get incorporated. So that's what I'm. That's what I'm betting. Like, I do think he did. You know, what it's going to feel like. I'm. Not, I'm sure we did it this episode with Helm's Deep, and next episode you're going to be like, oh yeah, this is going to be. Oh, funnily enough, the Council of Elrond, like type thing where you got them all coming together. You know, having a meeting. Yep, shout out to the Council yeah. of Elrond. So yeah, that, that that's <laughs> that's that's my prediction for it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, very good. That could be a very very interesting thing how that plays out will it be a slip from Durin or will Elrond break his oath I somehow can't imagine Elrond will break his oath mm. but and yeah that might be a thing to separate the Durin and his father maybe he's the one that kind of lets it slip or he's the one that wants to tell the elves about Mithril and maybe he betrays his father's trust and yeah that's interesting we'll get on to that probably next week when we find out what's happening there um mm. so we're nearly finished uh there's before the last last scene we have a small scene of Waldrig, I believe is his name. And he's, in my opinion, when he's talking to Theo, I'm like, oh, Waldrig is definitely going to become some servant of Sauron or, you know, he's he's definitely going to follow in, yeah. you know, the footsteps of all these like people that are going to be uh, serving Sauron. So um, what do you think, John, about this? Like, it seems yeah, like he, he already knows like... a lot about Sauron. He knows exactly how to inject himself with uh, yeah, everything. <laughs> He's like Maeglin or someone who's just like, he's already on the inside. He's yeah. going to take them down from the inside. Maybe he's going to yeah, let them true. know how to get in. And so I was like, it seems like he's already definitely, you know, swayed. He's speaking to the darkness, I suppose. And uh, and he confirms that that was his barn and he owned that sword. That's right. Because we were I speculating didn't... about whose that was before. Because we, we weren't yeah, sure. Maybe they said it, but we just... My theory was that it was Halbrand's barn before he left. But, you know, that's ended oh, up okay. not being... 
Cheers, well, sir. Good. Yeah, no, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that's the case. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so um, I think I think uh, Waldrick Waldrick is going to become a future. Maybe he is Sauron. But anyways, mm. um, we finally finish with Galadriel being sent away, and the petals start to fall, and then the, the decision is changed to aid her by Muriel. So, uh, Johnny, what did you what did you make of this whole? Like the last scene was about six or seven minutes long and it had that beautiful score of i think it's just the numenor score bear mccurry's one i think it's called what, white leaves which, that white, part. okay white leaves okay mm-hmm. I, I absolutely loved it but what what did, what did you mm-hmm. make of the whole scene john the way it finished yeah uh i'm trying to remember what actually happened so yeah she i, I really like just some small details i really like how when they're taking the small rowboats out to the ships the, the the people are rowing and whoever's there just stands like straight in the in the in the robot. They don't sit down because that's how they arrived as well when, when okay. they came in. Like a gondola. Uh, Galadriel. Yeah, kind of like a gondola and a, like a gondolin. And um, <laughs> it, it was like... The fall of um, gondola. <laughs> <laughs> it's when the so guy I, just falls out of the boat. <laughs> <laughs> I know, those little small details. I'm just like, oh, that's cool. It's just this is their custom that they have here that, you know, mm. you get taken from the ship into shore and vice versa you don't sit down you stand and you have to show how well balanced you are so um uh, i don't know there was that but then i also i remember from the trailer there's a scene of a ship in the the harbor and it looks like at numenor and it explodes and i was like is yeah. that gonna happen is yeah. are they gonna because i was like well, that was at maybe, nighttime. Maybe, mm-hmm. uh, yeah i know it's at nighttime but i was like you know sometimes it changes from day to night very quickly like when the when they were getting chased through the forest by the orcs and then suddenly True, it's like yeah. oh it's, it's actually daytime but um I was like, I wonder, will Muriel have secretly planted some bombs on the ship? Galadriel's going to get on, and she's going to sneak off the bomb, will, or the, the bomb will blow up, and they'll be like, oh, Galadriel's dead, but secretly, like, Muriel's helping her. And I was like, this would be really weird if that happened, but thankfully, that, that's not what happened. So, um, I don't know, I enjoyed I enjoyed the last scene. I, I enjoyed how Muriel, again, shows how good she is at public speaking, convincing all of the, the people that this is what we need to do for for the betterment of uh, of Numenor. Um, I thought it, I wasn't really sure I understood exactly what was going on with Farazan when he seemed to be in agreement with this. Well, um, for me, it's like, yeah, you've just given a speech where you said you won't, you know, ever let the elves get take control. You are still, Miriel doesn't have an heir. You're still technically because you're first cousin, you're in line as an heir, the throne. But not as mm-hmm. legitimate as Midiel's. The last king got overthrown for elf supporting, and now Midiel is making the decision to give military mm. aid to elves. So if you're Farazon, do you want to really intervene if he already has that ambitions? Because if, you know, the last weapon of Tar Palante, and if Midiel seems to be something like double what he did, and if there's a chance that, you know, that new and people don't like mm. that, who's the first person mm, they're going to go, you know? Get him in charge instead, Mister. You know, going this no, an course, hour yeah. an hour ago, fun of all yeah. these people. It's like, it's a uh, hopefully. Yeah. No, I agree, but it, it seemed like he almost publicly declared his allegiance. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. Decision. Mm-hmm. That's, that's that's what I. That's what seems strange to me. I agree with you completely that it. This is perfect for him. He's like, yeah, you go on, and then I'll. But it just it seems like you know, if 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 I were in his position, I'd kind of keep my cards close to my chest. I wouldn't make any public declarations, and then maybe when. After the fact, you could say, "Oh, I never agreed with this from the first place," and whatever. So, but yeah, if he's kind of on record sense. saying, "Yeah, mm-hmm. we should," I, but I, I I need to rewatch it again. It was, you know, just that there was that so one there was so much was, in that was, scene. There was so yeah, much going on. Lot. Like the, I think it was the one song playing throughout loads of different cut uh, cuts. We obviously see. It, it, it looks like as if um, Galadriel is being sent away. Then Muriel is walking through the se- streets. And the reason she changes her mind is because she sees all the, the petals flowing. But we don't know that yet when she's addressing the court. And it's almost kind of like, you know, a big shock twist at the end where Galadriel takes down her hood. And it's like, so I've decided to personally escort her to Middle Earth. And, you know, we're going to, we're leaving in 10 days. With an and, army. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and then it cuts to Elendil and he's calling out, like, who's going to aid me? And we get to see everyone. And also doing... showed Halbrand just wandering around. You're like, did, did, oh, yeah. he, did he escape? Yeah, or was he's he, gone. Like, 
I he's, he's, I don't he's get living that. his best life. That's what he's doing. He's <laughs> yeah. Escape or set loose. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, he's living his best life up in Numenor. Yeah, he's having a great time. That was interesting. There were so many things to to take in that I almost didn't realize. Yeah, that that's Halbrand. Why yeah. is he not in prison? But I suppose look, they just they're just sending everyone to Middle Earth, so they may as well release him too. But he seems happy. Or else to he stay. just got on Farazon's good side. From his little comments before, maybe. maybe he's you know wormed his way in there. Do we think he's going to stay back with Farazon? I don't think so. From shots yeah. we've seen from the trailers, at he's least he's in the armor. Seen him out like that. Oh, has right, armor, yeah, yeah. and he's horse riding. Yeah, with oh, okay. uh, Galadriel. Well, then that's good and because that would be of, another of him and Galadriel. Thing. Yeah, there's another scene. Yeah, exactly. If he stayed and they all went, you'd be like, well, yeah, definitely Sauron. Sauron. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, there's a scene of of uh, Galadriel and Halbrand sitting together in like armor at one point, and she's like. Whatever is bothering you from yeah, the past, yeah. uh, you know, I, I can't remember what it's Let it die. Say. Kill it if yeah. you have to. <laughs> I'm really, really looking forward to getting past all of the stuff from the from the, from the the trailers because it's yeah. just still so annoying. Be like, oh, I know that this is, he's like, you know, when, when we saw Aaron Deere being like imprisoned by the orcs and it looked like he, they were, they were going to kill him. If I hadn't seen any trailers, I'd be like, this character could die right now. And it'd be so much more higher stakes. But you're like, oh, I've seen him in a scene where he's, kicking a wall out in the tower and you're kind of going well I know that's going to happen and yeah, so true. obviously he's going to have escaped so I just much prefer when I don't know a character's location later on in the show because you're like well this character could just die in any moment especially a new character like Arondir so I do I however to... usually forget the trailer in the moments and I do kind of worry about someone and then it's only later that yeah. I look back and go like just there I forgot Halbrand was seen in you know a suit of armor somewhere yeah. else and i do remember him flipping a spear on a horse and i was like yeah that's pretty cool yeah so. but like when i am watching it i'm like oh my god is he going to die maybe i'm just not as clever mm. as you guys maybe I don't know. So. but yeah um i suppose that sums up the the entire episode i thought in my personal opinion i thought it was quite a strong episode every every episode has its merits but i think one of the best things about this one was that there wasn't any harfoot scenes and that really helped the pace of the episode i felt like it was breathtaking from the very beginning where we had the shots of numenor being destroyed and that kind of set the tone for the episode and then we didn't have to stop and go oh here we go harfoots again in their little storyline i am curious about them but i just do feel like it's a completely separate show it's like a different tv show altogether when we go to the harfoots but um yeah what are, what are your guys thoughts harry overall what did you make of the episode i liked the fact that we're past the, the this world building. We're past the introductions now. We're just into the meat of the story. We're, it's found its stride in this fourth episode, is what I I believe, and I really do like that. And I think even with the Harfits, they they are good. Slow the episodes down a little bit for for me personally. I think not the Me Too Man stuff with the Nordy. I think like some of the, you know the, the in the last episode, you know him giving the speech and everything that can be cut down a little bit. But I think Harfits still great. But in this episode, I think. That mixed with the fact we've seen Adar for the first time, I think we've all, we've all, I think that's been the top of like most people's watch list, seeing him, hearing him speak, his motive, etc. So I think all in all, it was a strong episode. I think you, you're correct actually. Each episode has gone stronger, stronger, and stronger. And I think hopefully that does continue. But yeah, overall, I am satisfied with this episode. Mm, yeah. yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed it. I've, um, uh, I you know we've we've heard a lot of people complaining about the initial opening couple of episodes and saying how they were a bit slow and things like that but um I believe it was uh, also I think was it the Tolkien professor I believe he said that in the first two hours in the first two episodes they introduced seven different locations which is more than we saw in all three of Peter Jackson's uh, trilogies so they they had to cover seven different locations in a two hour period. And so maybe that was one of the reasons why it was kind of maybe they like the story couldn't really get going at that point because they had oh, to do all of this yeah. introduction. And I mean, I didn't I didn't have a problem with that. But again, so, so many people I've heard saying like, oh, can you remember watching just the Fellowship of the Ring, the amount of story that happened in this compared to these first two or three episodes? And so that's kind of just some people's arguments so far. And I think to just hearing that the, the world that they're trying to build is just so much, it's so huge. And we want to really try and, I've got no problem with this kind of slow introduction to these new worlds so that like I'm sure we'll get the payoff in later episodes and in later seasons where we feel so involved in this world. So um, again, 
then that's so that's just one thing that we need to remember but then also this episode as a whole yeah no hard foot so the pace kept up the whole way through lots of really good dialogue and lots of really good scenes that i enjoyed there there weren't um any scenes that in their entirety i disliked there were some things that i just like some small things like, like i mentioned before maybe galadriel i'm i'm just surprised that she isn't better at convincing people and some of her speeches have felt a bit weak so yeah maybe that there's a couple of little small things that, that i could say weren't amazing we've kind of pointed out all the little negatives that we found but all in all i i, I love this episode i'm really looking forward to watching it again and i you know pretty much every single episode has left me really looking forward to next week's episode so that's a, a sign of a good show that's one thing yeah. i'd like to add for the first two three episodes there's been reliance on the cliffhanger. It's like the last one we had like three or four. This one, the, the story's moving in a direction that we know. Of course, the new Minorians Armada going to Middle Earth is a cliffhanger for the next episode, but it isn't like a, you know, oh, who's Tar Plant in the next episode? Oh, who's Adar in the next episode? Oh, yeah. Mithra. It's like, hmm. I'm, I'm excited for the next episode without having that, oh my god, I want to know what's like next, as in like, oh, we should have done it last week. That's what I really like about this episode as well. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Now, I yeah, well, I, I would say that in last week's episode, obviously they finish on that, like you know, the the kind of blurry of of uh, of Adar. That in no way made me want to see the next episode. I wasn't like I want to see the next episode because I want to know who Adar is. It's just I wanted to see the next episode because I don't know, yeah. it's just the story. My 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 soul is crying out for more time in Middle Earth, mm-hmm. and I'm just like really every time I'm sitting down to watch it, I just get so nervous. I'm so excited, and I mean, I'm just really enjoying it. So. Anybody, like, however this show ends up, I mean, even if, like, you know, it, I'm, I'm not happy with the, how the story plays out, I'm really enjoying the experience just as it's going along at the moment, so. Yeah, I both agree and disagree with you. I agree with you in terms of how the show makes me feel and I want to watch the next episode because of the story and the way it's moving along, but that shot of Adar at the end and not even getting to see his face in full focus, I was like, oh no, I'm dying really? to see, yeah, I really want to uh, see him. But, of course, um, I wanted to see him, but that, I'm saying that wasn't the thing that swayed yeah, me to like, the look forward to the next episode. Yeah, but I agree with Harry as well. Like, I, I like how this episode didn't depend on them giving us a cliff a cliffhanger mm, at the, doesn't at need the it. end. It doesn't need it. It it did have a great final scene of them like preparing to yeah. go to Middle Earth, and there was there was the change of heart. Well, it's not really a change of heart by Muriel, but she's like, oh crap, I sent her away, and suddenly the petals come. So. Um, yeah, uh, well, I think that's kind of what Muriel wanted to do initially, anyway. But she just knew that maybe what might happen to the kingdom if she took that decision. But then she was like, "Okay, the petals, it's a sign. I have to do it now." Yeah. So um, do what the yeah. petals do. The petals are always right. Petals. <laughs> so um, yeah, I think that's a that's probably a wrap there. That's probably all we have time for today. So. Mm. Harry, thank you so much for coming on. It's been it's been great. Uh, Cheers, man. It feels like it's been a long time since we've seen you. Yep. Thank you, boys. It's been an absolute pleasure doing this. Love uh, discussing the episode. And I think, oh, yeah, I think the main thing is I'm excited for next week. And that's the main thing that matters. I think uh, Johnny said it best. Spending more time in Middle Earth is what matters. So, yeah. And doing stuff like this as well. Because it just only adds to the enjoyment. So, thank you to you two as well. It's been a really fun discussion. Oh well, that's great. It has. Well, it's been really good, and also just to, to our listeners, Harry told us that he hasn't had sleep for about twenty four hours. So again, a huge thank you. <laughs> no, for I've been coming I've been on active. And, uh, I think <laughs> you've been active. Yeah. You've been active. No, you've been really good. You've been really good. I'm just saying that you it, that that didn't come across at all. But even more reason to say thank you so much no, for coming on. It's pleasure. No yeah, pleasure. Exactly. If you heard of him, lad? If you heard of sour? <laughs> So yeah, guys, that's uh, that's all we have time for today on the Council of Elrond. So please let us know what you guys thought of the episode and where you would rank it on the list of all four episodes as well. Is it the best? Is it the worst? Uh, also, let us know if we missed anything in our first watch because I think, well, I know myself and Johnny have only seen it the once. Um, there's go- there's definitely a couple of things that oh, Harry, you've got to be a few things that we missed already. Right? Yeah, yeah, like I know Narsil was in there, but there was probably lots of other cool things in that room so um and also let us know guys if you have any interesting theories on where the show is going to end up who is adar who is sauron who is halbrand all that lovely stuff and lastly a big shout out to our patrons and a special thank you to jack knightley so until next time guys we'll see you on the next episode to discuss episode four thank you very much and 
Sorry, five. episode five. <laughs> well, we can discuss episode four. We'll again. do it again. <laughs> All right. All right, guys. Cheerio. Bye.